Hello, friends, and welcome back to Stories About Entitled People. Let's start our video with a story in which our OP did what his boss told him to do, and it blew up in the boss's face. But before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you're new here, and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. Here we go. Policy to the letter is then. Okay, so before I get into the story, a quick preface. I'm the a-hole in this story. What I did wasn't exactly monumental, but it was a D-move. So I've worked for a reputable fast food place for the last three years. I won't name names, but let's call it Out and In. It's fast-paced and can be stressful at times, but the company's always treated me very well, and I do truly like my job. I like to think I'm a good associate who can get the job done, but anyone who's been at the company long enough knows you have to bend the rules sometimes to get the job done. For example, during what I refer to as a go F yourself rush, a rush so bad I'm pretty certain the community got together to F up my night by all showing up at once. Well, the story takes place during one of these rushes. I was positioned on fries and was having a dickens of a time trying to keep up with demand, moving as fast as you can according to policy, you can really only make about 40 fries in 10 minutes. Now, if you bend the rules a bit, combine baskets, put 30 seconds early, you can bring that up to 60 or maybe even 80 fries if you really stretch it. Well, considering the size of the rush, I was bending the rules here or there. Had to be done if I wanted everyone going home happy. As you can imagine, moods in the store can get significantly worse during these rushes, and I was no exception. As I'm trying to keep up with the rush, two of my managers very suddenly appeared to tell me how combining baskets was a major policy issue and I needed to strictly follow policy at all times. Now, I like these managers, great people, cared about their associates, and while they were 100% right, it was kind of accepted that during times like this, rules would be bent. So in my foul mood, supplemented by teenage angst and spite, I told them, right on, and policy would be followed. And you better damn believe I followed it to the letter. No baskets bigger than four dropped no less than 45 seconds apart and pulling only once the timer sounds. During a normal day of business, this would be fine. But with the current business, we went down fast, really fast. Within five minutes, we were 20 plus orders sitting on the fry table getting cold, just waiting on me, and not a GD fry ready for another two minutes. Managers are now freaking out, not seeing how this could have happened, I have a track record for being one of the best associates in store for fries, and with the way things were going, I'd have to be the worst for it to turn out like that. I let this go on for about 10 minutes until my manager quietly asked me to bend some rules to keep the customers from rioting. Now I wish that was an exaggeration, but people take their burgers pretty damn seriously. Another 10 minutes and we were free and clear again, honestly a pretty quick fix. The rush went on for probably another 30 minutes before calming down and allowing me to return to normal practices. I did end up apologizing for being a little craphead, but I'll tell you this, I'd do it again. And our second story. Cancel the order now. I'm taking my business elsewhere. So years ago, I worked in a call center for a large sporting goods store. It was a seasonal position for the holidays, and we were thrown right into the thick of it, eight-hour shifts with back-to-back -back calls lasting on average 10 minutes each, it was pretty stressful for us, and since our sales were way higher than expected, lots of stuff was back-ordered or out of stock for good. I dealt with my fair share of irate people, but since it wasn't face-to-face, -face, it was actually pretty easy to handle. One lady calls in and was a little stern, but she'd been on hold for nearly 30 minutes. We get through the order, and I'm checking on the stock of some big ticket items I knew were going to be back ordered. So I get to some random thing, and it was back ordered for six months, which shocked me. I explained this to her and how she won't get charged for the item until it ships. I offer to help her select a replacement item with a shorter wait time. She comes unglued and starts yelling at me. She goes on to say, cancel the order. I'm taking my business elsewhere. I tried to explain to her that I can save the order if she wishes, so if she happens to change her mind, she doesn't have to read off product numbers again. She doesn't really let me explain myself and keeps cutting me off. She says, just cancel the damn order. Don't save it, I'm never shopping here again. So I do as she pleases. I cancel the order and I flag her account as suspended due to her saying she was never shopping with us again. She hangs up and I go about my day. 
Towards the end of the shift, I get a call, and the number of the phone is linked to a suspended account. The man on the phone explains how his wife wanted to place an order earlier in the day, but cancel it due to us not having what she wanted. I realize this is the same account as earlier, so we would have to go through a long process of reactivating the account, then re-entering all the items. It took nearly 30 minutes to complete. At the end of the call, the wife gets back on the phone and starts yelling again. There's a bit of a struggle, and the husband gets the phone back and tells me to just place the order, which I do. Because her account was suspended, she lost a lot of points she'd gotten and moved herself from 1,000th on the back order list to about 2,000th. Funny thing was, after I left, I found out from a former co-worker, we only made 1,500 more of this item, so everyone after that on the list never got it. Had she just listened to me. Edit. I wasn't the one who suspended the account, I just flagged it. According to my policy, any customer who claimed they were never going to shop with us again would get their account flagged. Then a higher level would review it. The review would include looking at order frequency, order amounts, and any notes included. Then the reviewer would call or email the customer, asking them why they wanted their account terminated. Now, this process usually takes a few weeks to go from the time the account is flagged to the time the account is canceled. Due to high call volume, the reviewers were just blindly canceling accounts that were flagged without any follow-up. I didn't intend for it to happen so quickly. I just wanted this lady to be annoyed by calling us back and maybe someday having to reactivate this account, so I followed protocol by flagging the account and canceling the order. Due to the consequences of me following protocol, it became malicious. And our next story. Neighbor extends driveway onto our property, admits fault, and does nothing. Note, in the province of Ontario, the only legal and recognized land surveyor is an Ontario land surveyor, OLS. Your brother-in-law who knows how to work a transit just isn't qualified. I moved from the Toronto area back up north in 2007. In 2008, we bought a home on a four-acre forested lot from the original owner. Through conversations with the original owner, I remembered him muttering something about how the neighbor to the north had their driveway awful close to the property line. I thought no more about it until later that fall. Our neighbor's house was built slab on grade, and the builder must have messed up or not properly installed any drainage for the gravel pad. Every time it rained, they had water onto their ground floor, an inconvenience to say the least. But not my problem. That is, until the neighbor rented an excavator and had a deep ditch dug all along our side of his driveway, dumping all of rocks and spoil from the excavation onto our property. We also lost a number of trees... This all mature black maple sugar bush trees. I was getting concerned. We had problems with the jerk neighbor in Toronto and ended up having to get a survey and put up a fence. I wasn't going to lose any sleep worrying about it this time. Call for a surveyor and get this over with. It turns out the OLS firm I called were the ones who surveyed the development when it was built 10 years earlier. They had no trouble mapping out how and where the neighbor's driveway for over 100 feet now arced up to 12 feet onto our property, never mind the rocks and dirt in the bush beyond that. I sent a registered letter with a copy of the survey and a polite letter to our neighbor. With registered, you have to sign to pick it up. They received it but did not respond. I waited a month, then sent another registered letter. This one wasn't picked up and was returned to me. Yeah, that should work. If I don't receive the letter, everything will just go away. In way of explanation, the neighbor was a successful local businessman, and in smaller communities, some of them tend to think they're a bit special and can make their own rules. I learned from the jerk neighbor in Toronto that there's not much point trying to discuss things personally. We have a system, let's use it. The next letter that's sent to them is from our real estate law firm. They know the right language to use and how to get someone's attention. Surprise! That one not only gets picked up, but we receive a letter from their lawyer. They freely admit that they're at fault and will make everything right. Except they don't. They don't do anything for the next three years. Absolutely nothing. I started receiving expert advice from some of my friends. OP, you should fix it at your own cost, then sue them for that amount. Oh well, what if they claim that they could have fixed it a lot cheaper, or I did a bunch of things that weren't needed? OP, you should charge them for all the trees they cut down and make them replace them. Yeah, but we do live in the forest, and trees aren't really hard to find. In fact, we cut down trees that get too big, too close to the house. It's not like we're in the big city. I decide to do nothing. After the angst and sleepless nights with the jerks in Toronto, 
I decide to just wait it out. After all, they've admitted fault through their lawyer. It's not like they can wiggle out of that one or change their minds. I learn that the neighbor's wife hates living in the forest and would much rather have a schmancy house in town. And with the water problem that's never been resolved, it just isn't as much fun as they had thought it would be. Four years later, what I was waiting for, a realtor's for sale sign in front of their house. I stop and take a picture of the sign so that I have the phone number of the listing agent. I call them as soon as I get to work. Hi, this is OP. I see you're listing a property at XXX. You may not be aware of this, but your client is trespassing on my property. Of course, the neighbor can't pretend this isn't true, and now we have to clean up the mess to our satisfaction before the property can be sold. Oh my, the five-yard dump trucks ran for close to three weeks. They hauled load after load after load of topsoil. It had to be dumped, spread out, and compacted. The gravel driveway had to be dug up and pulled back to the property line, and all that filled in as well. At the end, it was all seeded with the understanding that it'll eventually go back to being forest. SJK, is it okay now? Not quite yet. Looks like there's still a lot of work to do. All the weeping tile rocks and piles of dirt were removed as well. Not a job easily done and very time consuming. Don't get mad. Wait, then get even. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.